Hey there, welcome to The Growth Whisperers, where every week we talk about how to build an enduring great business. All the things. You can't just do one little thing. If you want to build an enduring business that lasts decades or generations, there are so many important things that you need to do. And that's what we talk about right here. This week, as every week, I'm joined with my co-host, Kevin Lawrence. G'day, Kevin. How are you doing today? Doing great, Brad. We've spent a few hours tonight getting ready for this and, and working on some of the things we're working on. So I think I'm doing really good. Looking forward to today's show. It's, it's a topic I'm very, very passionate about because I've seen how it prevents painful, unnecessary mistakes in our businesses. So we will dig into that. And we'll, we'll tell you more about that in just a few minutes. Oh, yes, we will. And I'm excited to talk about it as well. But as always, we like to start with a one phrase or one word. What's your one phrase or word for today? My, my, my word is full. Full. Um, you know, it's interesting. I just we just had our, 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 um, our quarterly meeting with our team on uh, Thursday. and It was awesome. You know, we're, we're remote. So, you know, we had some uh, some great plannings on a combination of Zoom and Mural, and we figured out a lot of awesome stuff. Great debates, great decisions, and uh, and Janice from our team even set us up with a fun activity where um, everyone got sent uh, a little box they weren't allowed to open, and we had a Easter cookie decorating contest. Now I might have to contest the results because um, I didn't win. But, um, but we did have an impartial judgment. The point is we had a lot of fun. It was great. And out of that, it came up with some very, um, some serious things I need to get done in quarter two of this year, which is, you know, April through June. Uh, I also want to have some time with my kids and my family and, and uh, friends and at the racetrack. And you and I have some goals too. So I'm feeling like I got, I got a lot of priorities and I think I might have two. And before we started... I was just making a note, I might need to pare back on some of my other goals because it's just, you know, it's that, um, you know, there's that phrase, you know, biting off more than you can chew. And I want to, I want to, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm full because I think I've overcommitted is what it is. And I need to adjust that right away so that I can have an awesome quarter, both for myself and for my work and life too. Oh, very good. Very good. So for yeah. myself, myself something slightly different um it's scoreboard um ah. so <clears throat> yeah so i was reflecting with um the football season has started up here in australia and this is not soccer uh despite yeah. what some may think this is australian rules football uh and so that started up again we're a couple of games in and i was just reflecting we had a game last week where it ended up being uh, a one point difference um, hmm. And so let's say it was about 70 or 80 points for the whole match. Uh, there was only one point difference. And it was, uh, it was an arm wrestle the whole way through. And what it made me think is the power and the trust of the scoreboard um, and how much hmm. that influences um, the emotions of the crowd. People are standing up and yelling. People are... Uh, uh, completely trusting in the scoreboard. And then if you translate that back into our business, um, do people really trust our scoreboard? Um, you know, they've got to trust the scoreboard to be emotional about it. They've got to know that what are the rules of the game that we're playing mm. and how much do I trust the scoreboard that we watch together? Um, so yeah, that's what's on my mind is is the scoreboard. And you, I know you and I have done a, a, a podcast yeah. episode about dashboards, um, and and this is kind of on the same thing. But yeah, it was just reflecting just how worked up the crowd get because they try they know the rules and they trust um, the the scoreboard. That's interesting because you often see in companies where where people don't trust the data that comes from the finance team or the operations team. And they spend so much time in passionate debates about the numbers being right or not. And they're not able to focus on the game metaphorically or what needs to be done in a business because they're disputing the score. 
and the yeah. accuracy of that's awesome. So if we kind of mash together our 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 our, our words of the day, we're going to have a we're driving for a full scoreboard. And a full scoreboard could be a great thing because that could be equated to winning and order. it could also be equated to building an enduring great company. So today's show with a full scoreboard as we talk about scorecards, which is the theme of today. And so today we're talking about this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thing called the job scorecard uh, developed and popularized by Brad Spart, the author of Top Grading. Um, his son, Jeff, did a book called Who, uh, as a almost a mid-market version of the book that um, takes it as a slightly different version of it. But really, it's, it's a, instead of taking, you know, the generic, typical job description, which is a almost a little, liter, little, little, little literary piece, a whole bunch of words to describe, try and describe a human, we do more of a mathematical piece or an engineering piece and come up with numbers and facts and data to define the person we're looking for. And, you know, I, I, I recently um, done a bunch of work with uh, over the past while with Chris Marceau, the, the, the president of top grading, he you know, runs the business on behalf of, of Brad smart. And we were doing a session for a group and we were uh, for our CEOs that we work with. And I was describing a metaphor. I came up with a job scorecard and, and I know, and Chris and I were chuckling about it afterwards, but it's very simple. It's like, you know, most job descriptions, when we def try to define the spectacular human who's going to create tremendous value in our company, most of those job descriptions are equivalent to a three-year-old's child's drawing of a bridge. And they can be colorful and interesting just don't happen to be that precise in helping us choose who should be a part of the job and not. And, you know, this job scorecard that the, the, the smarts have popularized is closer to an engineer's drawing of that same bridge. And nothing wrong with starting with a child's drawing, right? And that's the typical, we know we need a VP of finance and we know that they're going to have five direct reports and a team of 25 people and blah, blah, blah. So that's kind of like the child's drawing. But then this job scorecard is such an amazing tool. We then send it to the engineering department and have the engineers do a bunch of testing and mathematics and come back with a very precise drawing that we're going to work from rather than the crayon sketch. So that's kind of what we're talking about today is, is, is this amazing tool called job scorecard. So Brad, I'd like to ask you, like, why... I know why I love it so much, but why do you love this thing so much? Like, why is it such an important thing in your mind? I'm going to answer that by <clears throat> answering, you, you know, with politicians, you ask them a question and they answer the question they really want to be asked. Well, that's an interesting thing, but I'm going to answer a different question in any sense. So, of course. So the reason that I love the job scorecard is I go back when I had a business many, many, many years ago, like 20 years ago, and we needed to hire a role and it was a new role to our organization. And, you know, we had the mindset of let's get it done, right? We've got to get things. It's about sure. the, the result. It's about the completion more than it is about what took you to get the completion. So in this context, we did what so many other entrepreneurs do. And we said, hey, what's the role? <clears throat> what is the title that we need? And then we would go to the job board. So the online job board, we would copy the job advert that we felt was most aligned to what we need, word for word. And then we'd edit it to, to our language yeah. And then we would post it up and that would be about the amount of preparation that we would do at that point. And it was, it was, it got the job done because that was our mindset. Okay. But it was completely ineffective from that point onward. Okay. So if you say the job to be done was to post an advert, well, well, yeah, we got to post an advert and people applied to that advert. But, but we missed a crucial step. So the reason that I love it, coming back to your question, the reason that I really love it is that it bec because it, it's a planning tool 
that is a tool that we can use all the way through all of the steps of engagement from hello right. my name is brad right through to you're fired or you're retired yeah and not only is it something that helps you to define and make sure you actually get the right human in the company yeah it's then a tool to help you to manage that person to greatness not giving examples some people say well we need to hire a salesperson well go find a job description online for a salesperson copy that put an ad for a salesperson. Hey, we'll get a salesperson. And the truth is you might hire an excellent salesperson, but you might not realize there's probably 25 to 30 different versions of that salesperson. It's like saying, it's, it's like a, a hunter saying they want to go get themselves a deer. Well, there's lots of different types of deer. And there's yeah. lot, and if you're not aware, you you could get one, but it's not the right one. I'll give you an example. Um, so it, even with salespeople, there's inside salespeople, there's outside salespeople, there's outside relationship managing salespeople, and there's outside hunting salespeople. Um, and, and there's different types. So for an example, uh, just to build off of that, I remember a key executive that we hired. He was amazing. He was an A player in a different organization. So he came from a big company uh, with that had been around for years that had processes and systems, and it had a sales cycle that was 18 to 24 months. And an average sale that was a few million dollars, after, many million dollars after that 18 to 24 month sales cycle. He came from that corporate environment, long sales cycle, big ticket item, and he came into a business that had a two hour sales cycle. And he reported, uh, uh, and a $30,000 average ticket si size. And he reported directly to an awesome, but somewhat crazy entrepreneur. So even though this guy had the right, he was the right type of person, if we had had a scorecard, we would see that, okay, he doesn't match on the type of sales. You know, he's type 13 as a, as a sales leader, and we need a type 24 because he doesn't match on yeah. that. He doesn't match on, on the type of person that he's reporting. You'd say, it's like, there's a whole bunch of things there that, that, that he would predictably fail. But if we had done a really thorough scorecard and really thought about the candidate and evaluated him against it, he wouldn't have been hired. Now, again, we had the guy ended up getting let go. He was a wonderful man. I love the guy. He just, he never could have, he, he would never would have succeeded in that role. And it's like, you know, yeah, there's lots, lots of metaphors for it, but it's just, it was, it was a miseducated hire. And we didn't do enough of the right work up front to really spec with that engineering's drawing of really who we needed to be successful there. And, and that's an important point. The, the, if we go back to the example that I gave, whereby we're just copying someone else's job advert, and that's all the preparation that we're really doing until perhaps the candidate arrives for an interview, um, you know, what we're doing is reducing the, the chance of a failure by building a job scorecard, a detailed yes. job scorecard that we're going to talk about a bit further on in this podcast. Yeah. But isn't that what we want? Like, we want to have a much, much better chance of being able to hire the right person, A. But then B, also, we want a tool all the way through that person's journey that we can use uh, to measure their performance and their activities. And are they going according to what we need from this role? Are they Correct. performing? Yeah, because we've really, really clearly defined the role. That, and that's the point of it. So let's talk about the first piece. What is it? And in that first phase, it's about, you know, the engineer's drawing of what you want. The second phase is evaluating people against that, Right. And if you need the person in your basketball team and you need them to be at least six foot six tall, well, that's an important piece of data. And if someone's only six one, 
you know, maybe, and I'm not saying, you know, we're not going to, you know, discriminate based on business, but in, in basketball, you know, if, if it's, whether it's height or an ability to, to do a slam dunk or whatever the heck it is that they require, the point of it is, is, is then you can compare them to the engineer's drawing. So, yeah. so let's, let's go to that first piece and what is on this scorecard, as we said up front, it still does have some words, but it's, it's, they're more words that define specifics that can be measured versus feelings and beautiful pro pro i'd say praise but pros mm -hmm. um so so Brad, let's talk about the different the key different aspects of it yeah so um i guess we'll start off by saying we may have slightly different perspectives on it and that's okay but we're probably within the ballpark together on most things so in my experience, what we've got is, first of all, a set of responsibilities. Um, and so that is, you are responsible for um, A and B and C. And then we've got the measures of success or the, the key performance indicators. Um, and that might be, um, you need to um, increase the sales budget from 100,000 to 130,000. Um, by October 2021 or whatever that might be. Some, some very, very specific measures of success that are set in stone that we know exactly what that is going to be about. Yeah. Um, and those can be operational metrics or KPIs on an ongoing basis, or they can be targets to achieve within a time frame, like the first year or something like that. But it's very tangible outcomes that that person will be accountable for. Yeah, and, and then um, recruiting points. So that means um, things that really matter within this role that are intangible in terms of the KPIs or the, um, or the responsibilities. Uh, and then the competencies that this person requires. Um, so competencies meaning... Uh, if they're a salesperson, you know, they've got to have an engaging personality, perhaps. Uh, they've got to have good listening skills. They've got to have good customer focus uh, or good first in, or first or first or first impression. Yeah. Or maybe they need intelligence or maybe they don't. Yeah. And that's and that's why those competencies are so important. You're defining on these 50 different factors you can measure a human by. And there's different set, there's different competency models out there. The one that they have is excellent, but it's defining how good they need to be or don't need to be at it. And it's picking 10 or 12 of them that are non-negotiables. If they don't have them, they can't do the job. And those that competency grid, I tell you, Brad, has saved me so much. Yeah, because I got know about you. I'm a coach. I believe in people. I love people. But even these 50 competencies are color coded and, and color coded. If it's easy to change, um, it can be changed with some hard work or if it's very difficult to change. And when I look at the ones that are red and they call very difficult to change in my mind, you know, it's not changing unless there's some massive intervention. That's the way I think of it. That's not what they say. That's what I think of it which really means to me, hey, Kevin, don't be optimistic. If they don't have intelligence, it's not going to change. If they don't have drive or ambition, it's not going to change. If they're not good with conflict, they'll never be good with conflict. Yeah. And, and, it, and it's, it's a way to keep the optimists in the room um, or from, from over being enthusiastic or the pessimists who say it can't change. But yet if it's a green competency, it's been proven it can. So that the competencies are massively valuable, massive. And if I, if I could only keep one piece of the job scorecard, you know, I would fight for that to be it because it yeah. helps our clients so much. And again, that's the, that's the spec. That's the, that's the data that helps to create the engineer's drawing, the, the, the rating uh, on a scale of zero or sorry, one to five on those competencies. Anyway, sorry, I got excited about that one, Brad. That, that one is a game changer. It was a life changer for me once I saw that and I could see why I'd been involved in some bad uh, hiring decisions. Look, like, it really mm -hmm. is. And, and what's important is that before you meet any candidates, 
you're looking at these uh, 50 competencies and you're saying, well, if it's a salesperson in a sales role um, and uh, competency number 50, for example, is tenacity, okay? So if, they, if they're not tenacious, like it's very difficult to change and they need to be good at that. They need to be tenacious to succeed as a salesperson in our organization. So you're mapping it maybe. before you meet them. Maybe, maybe. Um, oh, no, no, oh, that was an example. I'm not saying they yeah. must be oh, across sure. all examples. For sure. But I'm saying in some sales organizations, they wouldn't have, to. that's the key. Yeah. If it's a retail sales environment, that that tenacity, you know, if, if you know, the, the ratings, you know, one to five is three is a average college grad, you know, as, as a baseline, for example, on, on say things like, you know, intelligence or other things, but you know, like a three might be okay in, uh, in that. Now, if we're running a timeshare company in Mexico, you know, the tenacious tenacity probably needs to be a five yeah. because that's a hard close, high pressure sale. Um, and that's, and the key, and, you know, and the fascinating part about this, the key is getting the team that's doing the interviews to agree up front. That is critical. Whether the hiring manager, HR, and whoever else is involved in this to agree, because if they can't agree on this, they don't hire. Don't don't even don't even promote the role yet, yeah. Because it's in many ways, if we can't agree the, the, the where the bridge is going to cross the river, and 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 what 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 style of bridge that we want, um, don't put it out to bid yet to the contractors. We need to be clear on what we're looking for before we move on. It's it it it's, it, it helps you a lot down the road. But we will find when we start when people want to hire, and we start asking a bunch of questions. And for example. I was talking to an entrepreneur the other day, someone referred to me and, um, and we got talking about this and I was like, yeah, and I got to hire a, a new, you know, a, a new, uh, a salesperson. Well, as I'm talking to him, he's talking about oh, both sides of his mouth. He's what? talking about hiring a salesperson and he's talking about hiring a sales manager. I'm like, buddy, you know, I love your ambition, but you need a salesperson and a sales manager, it's like a difference between an, el an el elephant and a mouse. Like they're, they're very different animals and you're not going to get an elephant mouse, right? You're not going to get it. You know, you might have a, a, a salesperson that could grow to a sales manager, or you might have a sales manager who's willing to do, you know, do a little bit of sales as part of their job, but, but they're, they're very different. And it's a very different job. It's a very different job scorecard, very different competencies for each of those roles. So <laughs> you got to be clearer. Otherwise, you're going to likely uh, get yourself in a lot of trouble. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> but so many people shortchange the sales manager role. That's a different podcast. I'll tell you that. I could get in deep into that because the sales manager is its own thing. But let's come back. The competency, I, 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 yeah, I got it. Yes. The competency assessment is a key part of it. So we've got the responsibilities, we've got the measures of success, we've got the competency, uh, competency assessment. There, there are these key parts that make it more than a job description, as some people may have used that phrase. The old job description is going to maybe have a couple of KPIs, maybe have a, a fluffy sentence, but it's not a job scorecard because this digs in so much deeper and it gives you so much granularity. Once you've built the job scorecard, when you begin to interview and maybe even when you write the job advert, because you know this is exactly the type of person that we need, A, and um, B, then from within the pool of candidates that we get, we're able to understand what will an A player actually look like, which yep. that's our goal, an A player. Yep. Absolutely. So, you know, we've, one of our points here is, is, is that, you know, you know, why you need one? Well, you need one because you need to be crystal clear about what that role is and the team involved in the hiring needs to be crystal clear on it, for sure. You now, other points is like, what is it? It's really a detailed, uh, take the old job description and make it something that's, you know, that the, the, the finance department and the legal department would be happy with because it's so specific. And not for finance or legal reasons, but technical minds 
uh, would be very, very happy with it. Um, so, you know, in simple, how would you just, if to boil down in simple terms, the differences, what would you say, Brad? Which differences? Between, between... this and a normal job, between a normal job <laughs> description. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So just to boil it down, we've covered law of law. How would you boil it down? All right, job normal job description, um, purpose of the role, number one, um, who you report to and what your responsibilities are day to day. Maybe some KPIs. That's what I would expect to see in a normal job description. Yes. But it's it's fluffy uh, and it's 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 not as it's it's not written in a specific manner. And therefore, it can't be used as a tool along the way, uh, in the way in which we want to use the job scorecard. Okay, so it's it's a bit fluffier. It can really let many many candidates through that won't fulfill the A player obligation. Yeah, and it's you know closer to that child's drawing versus the mathematical. We take even though some of the content might be the same. If you were just to how would you, you know, beef up that normal job description is when you would shorten down a lot of the words because they don't help in a lot of cases, mm. but you would add in a section of those KPIs or those outcomes, those, those, those deliverables that most person must have. Uh, and then the second thing is you would, you would put in the competency, the competencies and the ratings of those competencies. And those are well, the two major sections that are game changers. Yeah, or you would get the job description and chuck it in the bin and then read top grading and then build the example from right, top That grading. is the best thing to do. Absolutely, <laughs> Brad. Although, you know, I've seen situations where you can take and pull out of that two-page verbal job description, you can pull, you know, uh, two or three sentences out for the description of the role. And then you can pull out a few things for some key responsibilities. And then the rest, you have to sit down and start debating what is it or what, yeah. what isn't it. It's, um, it's pretty clear. So as we, as we dug into it, you know, and with companies that we work with, you know, and I've shared before, like I demand, D-E-M-A-N-D, that our clients use top grading and that we use job scorecards. It's, it's not an option. You know, we've got two people on our team who are completely focused on top grading and interviewing. So we, gen you know, we do lots of training on it uh, and we generally um, uh, do the interviews for the top two layers of the organization, direct reports to the CEO and the ones below that consistent. And some other roles we get involved in and help with um, because creating, creating a job scorecards work. And after yeah. you've done a few, it gets easier. Uh, and, and even then doing the proper interview, the top, and we've got another podcast where we've talked about that top creating interview. It's a, it's a, it's a serious discipline and it's work because you know, all, and all the top grading interview is once you get there is you take the engineer's drawing of the bridge and you're just doing an engineering spec on the human that you're interviewing, seeing if they can match the one of the bridge with data and facts and who they are and how they work and where they thrive and where they don't. Uh, but it's, you know, 10, 20 times the data you pull out of them. Uh, almost per hour in yeah. a top grading interview, uh, yeah. which is that, which is that, is that second piece. So let's go, let's go to, so let's just say we've got a, we've got a company that we're talking to and, and then say, okay, the, you guys, Brad and Kevin, you're, you're saying this is the right thing to do. How, how, how does somebody get started? Like one, you know, one company approached us and said, okay, we want you to, we want to hire you and we want you to help us do all of our job scorecards for our whole company. And, 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 and we promptly said, um, uh, no, <laughs> that's a horrible idea. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like reading, you know, back in the days when we were in school, Brad, and there used to be these things called encyclopedias, you know, these big collections of books. Yeah. It would be like reading the entire set of encyclopedias or, or reading every book in, in, in the grade that you're in in school and then writing one exam. Uh -huh. um, you're going to fail. Yeah. It's way too much. So, so how, how, how do we recommend people get going with doing a proper job scorecard? I'm interested in your advice, but <clears throat> your suggestion, your um, recommendation, my thought 
is when you have a vacancy. So as a vacancy comes up, be it for a new role or an existing role, um, start the process there. Um, and um, one thing, one very important thing, when hiring, we always recommend hiring in pairs. So you would have one candidate and you would have two interviewers. And the part of the job of the interviewers is, is to discuss this job scorecard before they do the interview around all of the competencies to be able to, 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 to go in and agree, yeah, uh, definitely um, likability is hard to change or easy to change or whatever in relation to this role. So having a clear understanding, A, of the job scorecard for that individual when yep. they're going to do that, because that's an urgency in terms of hiring the person rather than a role where we not, might not be hiring for someone yeah. for three years. So just focusing on the most important things, having two people who are running that process and building the job scorecard for that um, and then measuring the person, the people who they interview along that journey. Yeah, that's, 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 that's the way one of the things that we recommend is start with the active roles. Yeah. And so either it's the next role you're going to hire or promote because the same process is wired for promote required for promotions. Promotions have the same failure rate as external hires, contrary to popular belief. Same risk because, you know, with the internal candidates, we already know and love them. And we forget that there could be big gaps in their capability at that next level that will cause them to fail. So, yes, that's it. That's an excellent place to start. Uh, for example, we have another company that's approached us. We did a similar project over the holidays, another company that's approached us and wants to help with succession of some key leaders and the CEO. And, and so that, that, that's a prime example. So we're going to go in and, you know, as, as long as we end up working together, which likely we will, is we're going to go in and we will figure out the scorecard for the CEO. It's a, it's a substantial, you know, company. So substantial mid-market company. So we will do the scorecard for the CEO. That'll be quite a bit of work to get it and get it right. Now, thankfully, the CEO is still in the role, you know, where we did one before where the CEO had sadly had passed away. But, you know, define the scorecard, and then we can start to evaluate existing candidates for that role against what's required. Now, the good news is that CEO is not going anywhere anytime soon. So we've got time to develop if, if they're, they're developable, developable competencies. We've got, you know, three, five years to develop the successors to see who can step up and fill those gaps. So it's, a, it's as much as a, a development process at this stage as, as it is a decision process, because we're just gonna find, here's the, you know, the, the engineering spec of the bridge. Here's this person, oh, they're missing these components. Let's see if we can build those into that person. What projects can we give them? What training can we do? So in that case, uh, yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a for the 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 hot hires that you have or the hot topics or the the situations that are live hires or promotions uh, is a is a, is is the absolute best place to start. From there, once you start to get it and get get a get a handle of the system, well, then you'll naturally cascade it somewhere else. But if you do too much too fast, it'll fall on its face. It's not gonna it's not gonna work. It, uh, nothing works. <laughs> Last week, we spoke about Joey Chestnut, right? The major league eating champion. Um, you cannot, you know, you're not Joey Chestnut. You can only eat so much or consume, produce so much so fast. Same principle here. Like you can only get so much done. So what's an, another question that uh, someone may ask us or may be thinking is, well, you know, at the moment, we, uh, we use Myers-Briggs or we use a personality assessment um, and that seems to produce good results. Why should I consider changing my mm. job description when this current system seems to mm. work? What might be your answer to that? Well, first thing I would ask is uh, confirm if they're making hiring decisions only by a psychometric assessment, which would be uh, in some many cases not legal and two, unintelligent because that's not enough information on a person. I, I, I'm one of the biggest fans of psychometrics and we tend to use DISC, which is like Myers-Briggs and Enneagram and Strengths that comes out of Gallup. They're awesome. 
But all they'll do is if we go into the animal world, say that you're kind of elephant-like or you're mouse-like or you're lion-like or you're giraffe-like or you're hippopotamus-like. Doesn't mean you're a good one or a capable one. It just, it kind of categorizes you into some styles, which is helpful. And we know from benchmarking and companies, you know, there's a certain roles where elephant-like personalities do well. And there's other roles where lion types do well or giraffe. So it's, it's directionally helpful, but my gosh, it's sure not enough in, to, to make a proper decision. So on hiring someone. Uh, and the second we, thing I want to ask is, tell, 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 tell me, I'd love to see your stats of what percentage of your hires turn out to be A players after six months. Oh, yeah, we don't so, measure so that. Yeah, I, I, and, and that's probably good that you don't. <laughs> now, I would encourage that you do so we can validate because if you're getting north, which we aim for, north of all of our hires being what we consider an A player, that's someone who fits the culture very well and consistently delivers on expectations. If 75% of people that you hire are that after six months, well, then stick to what you're doing because that's what we're trying to get to. So, so from my perspective, scorecard sets the framework. In our firm, we, do, we use DISC and Enneagram to give us better understanding of the client. But just because if let's say the I'm, I'm using animal metaphors just to simplify it, but let's just say that it was an elephant type profile that some of the highest performers have had in that role. Um, and this person has that same type of profile because you can do profile matching with yeah. these assessments. Um, but that, but that doesn't mean, I mean, you know, that, that, that elephant might have mental issues. They might have personal issues. They might have, you know, a whole bunch of other things that, that that psychometric won't tell you. So, but the combination of psychometric to help you understand them better, and then an incredibly thorough top grading interview gives you a lot of what you need to make a right decision. But hey, if what you're doing is working and you're happy with it, you know, why would you change? Well, do you know, in the olden days, people used to perform on stage. And uh, in the olden days, uh, sometimes some people would take tomatoes to that performance just in case that performer wasn't that great. Mm -hmm. uh, so grab your tomatoes, get them at the ready, because uh, what I'm going to say is a psychometric assessment isn't a job scorecard, okay? It's, it's, Gosh, it's no. nothing like it. And if it was a spectrum, now I'm not saying that is, but if it was, at one end, uh, you might have a horoscope. And then at yes. the middle, you might have a psychometric assessment. It's going to give you a bit of a flavor. And at the other end, driven by a lot of information and competency measurement and understanding and thinking, you've got the job scorecard. So, uh, yeah, at one end, you've got the job scorecard. At the other, you've got the the horoscope because sure maybe scorpios will work better in your sales team and maybe we can make that um that correlation maybe. okay and i'm being a little bit silly here so uh, hopefully you haven't thrown too many tomatoes but the point is um they should be a advisory a, a psychometric assessment they shouldn't be the sole decision making no, tool. gosh no that would be absolutely absurd, and but, but people no, and it. some people and some people might. But that's yeah, it just that just tells you personality and communication, like with with, with communication styles. It doesn't tell you anything about whether how good they are. The different things you need people to be good at, and it's and it's fascinating, you know. And then the worst part about interviewing is that you know, based on research, you know, most people make their decision within about five minutes of whether they're going to hire the person or not, less in many cases. You know the problem with that? You're generally judging the person by one competency in the first five minutes, aside from attractiveness, which does have an impact on getting hired, uh, the, the, which is not a competency. But the one competency that you're normally picking up in the first five minutes, maybe two. One, it's called first impression. 
And the second is the one about their verbal communication skills. So you're picking up on those two things generally within the first five minutes and you're making your decision. Now, if they're going to be a greeter at Walmart and welcoming people that come into the store, hey, first impression is super important, mm. right? Or maybe if it's, if it's the host or hostess in a restaurant, you know, first impression and verbal skills are insanely important. But what percentage of the jobs out there do you think that first impression is all that matters? Not many. <laughs> yeah, I'd say 15 or 20% at a wild Max. guess. Yeah. Well, we're, I'm saying where it's the only thing that matters. Oh, like, it would be less 10. than 1%. Yeah. yeah. Very little. Yeah, because it's, it's, it's like you got to back it up with something. So that's a problem with most of our hiring decisions. It's based on, based on first impression and, and verbal communication skills and attractiveness. Yeah. Well, in most jobs, that's, that's less than 1% of the actual job, but it's a huge por portion of what's causing us to make our decisions if we're truly making those decisions in five minutes, which months, minutes, which most people do. Yeah, so the job isn't to be an interviewee. Right. So I'm not trying to win a job to be an interviewee. And we, yes, we should exactly we should have the tool, which is the job scorecard to be able to deliver on that. So quick question, who builds the job scorecard? I think we've kind of touched on that. But to be specific, well, you get the, you get the person in the horoscope department who really likes psychometrics and is a fan of elephants. That's who you get to do the 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 job scorecard. You get those the, and and they sit there and they cross their knees and they go, mm. yeah, that's 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 how you do it. Or if that didn't work after you tried it a few times, who might be the second best person? Generally, it should be the hiring manager with the support of HR. Yeah, yeah. So who's right? the, the hiring manager? The hiring the manager. Job. Yeah. Yep. And HR should be a part of it because they're the HR is meant to master the processes and hold us to the standards and be masters of these tools. And the best HR people are, uh, but HR can't do it because they don't know the job well enough. The HR manager knows the job, but doesn't know the process normally. And then it should be reviewed by the manager's manager. Right. Right. This does a, as, as a double check in the process is just, you know, that's my perspective. Now, you know, and in some cases, then after that, if you're, if it's a real serious role, if they, if they work, you know, as part of a, you know, a, a cross-functional teams of pieces like that, you might get someone from those other cross functions to take a look at it as well. You know, this is, this is the critical, again, the engineering of the bridge before you build it is darn important. Yeah. So, you want so, to know so getting that wire. right is super important. And I will tell you, we, we debate them. You know, we'll get the the, the people, the, the the manager and HR to draft it. The other their manager to look at it, and then you know, in some some way we will debate them, especially for the senior roles. I'm always always normally part of that, and we debate the heck out of those. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's so important to not have a piece of paperwork, but to have a tool that you can use all along the way. And if if you say, okay, we're three weeks or three months or three years into this role, we can look at this and go, yes, I'm confident. If the person is uh, aligning with the needs that we've got, they'll be successful in the role. So fundamentally important. Yes. Yes. So why don't we talk about, let's just say, okay, you've got it. You've got a great, a job, great job scorecard using the templates that the people at top grading and, you know, in the book top grading or, or who, and they've got some great examples and resources. They've done, they've done an awesome, awesome job. Make sure that they are getting any credit for this, right? We use it. They developed it uh, and continue to develop it. So you've got this um, great job scorecard. The, all the key people agree. Let's just say that you've then learned how to do a proper top grading interview, excavating boatloads of data. And then at the end, you would now go back with data and decide how well the person fits. Do they meet those key things that they need to have? Does our environment match the environments that they have thrived in? Um, and if we go and rate the candidate on those competencies, where are their scores perfectly in line? 
And where are the gaps? Are the gaps things that can be closed? Are the gaps things that we can live with? And when everyone, when you get someone who's so passionate about a candidate, oh, we got to hire them. I love them. I love them. I love them. Okay. Let's take a look at the competencies and look at the facts. You can reground that person. Or if you've got someone that hates them, well, where in the competencies were they out? Where don't they match? And it goes from a feeling to a facts conversation. So let's just say we got that. Yeah. And, 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 we, and we hired the right candidate. Now that's easier said than done. That's work. But let's say we got that. Then there's, you know, getting them on boarded and then managing performance. So, you know, and I know this is a passion of yours, Brad. So one, now that we've got the right clarity in the role and the right person, how does this tool set us up to win going forward? Yeah, um, currently I'm writing a book about onboarding. Uh, I've done a research project with 1,100 CEOs and hiring managers around the world. So yeah, pretty passionate about it. Uh, due for at least at some point, hopefully in the next year uh, or 18 months, uh, it's coming along well. So to your question, um, how what does success look like from the manager's perspective. That's really a central part, which is why the job scorecard is so pivotal between the hiring process and the onboarding process. This is the, the vehicle that carries us through. So um, there's an, a supplemental, supplemental component to this, um, which is the onboarding um, plan, um, but that feeds straight off the job scorecard. Okay, so the job scorecard should tell us, uh, should give us a direction or a compass on within 90 days, this person uh, will have this level of clarity. And just like you're building a job scorecard to for the for the role that will help us to understand the, the hiring process and forward, the, the, the onboarding plan is very much about the first 90 days because we want to have confidence to fire the person, okay? We want to have confidence to fire yes. the person in 90 days' time legally because the research that I've done, almost all, let's say most countries around the world have legislation which says that you can fire a person if they're the wrong person within 90 days. Now, of course, check with your local employment law expert, yep. okay? But that's why this 90-day period is so crucial because we want to have confidence to exit the person if they're not right um, or to even extend that probation period. Um, and so the, the, the job scorecard, it, it, it tells us what the person will do and then the onboarding plan will tell us um, how to how the person, what the person must achieve within 90 days. Yeah, and so basically you take that job scorecard and you build the onboarding plan based on that. Correct. Of how you're going to get them up to speed. And you know, it's interesting, Brad, and I, I'm excited to see when your book comes out because man, do I see the onboarding get messed up a lot, a lot. Yeah. And the best, the best, the best companies I've seen do it. They, they have a very, very defined process for that three month period with regular check-ins, scheduled pieces, and putting the person in the right psychological state to win. And you know, I have a chat with every new executive that comes into the companies I work with that I get the chance to, and say, hey, in the first three months, listen, learn. We already know you're awesome. Don't go and try and prove yourself. Because if you try and prove yourself, you do way too much, way too fast, and generally make a mess. The smartest, yeah. you know, super experienced people already know that, but a lot of people are so passionate and excited and want to show their value. And, and they, yeah, they just, they, they make enemies and they, and, and, and they, they make a, they create problems in the system very, very early on. And then again, that's, that's one tiny piece of a proper onboarding, tiny, yeah. tiny piece that can make or break, especially in executive roles. To pick up on your first point there, the really interesting data from the research that I've done, 86% of companies have a 14 day or less onboarding process. Okay, 14 days or less. But the real magic happens. The real change in impact happens after 30 days. 
Okay, so that 30, 60, 90 days, the companies had that had those level of onboarding processes, that's where you really start to say, see that companies were saying, this is where the real impact happens. So it's that, that's why I love onboarding, because it's like this, this great opportunity that no one, that 86% of people don't really know or pay respect to, uh, and and that's where the real massive gains are had looking forward. But maybe onboarding is for another podcast. Like I know I we'll think be doing it some might stuff be, on that. Brad. The yeah. key, the key, the key point of this of, of everything that we're talking about here is is that you have this amazing engineering drawing, the scorecard of a role. Then you can use that to define onboarding and how we're going to get them to move ahead. All right, last piece we want to mention, and we'll wrap up here, Brad is that it's also helpful in performance management. So when someone isn't doing well in their role, you can go back to the scorecard. Which of the competencies are they not thriving on? Are they having a problem with? Where, where is it they're failing? Versus, oh, I don't like them, oh, this. You can go back to the competencies or the core values and then help pinpoint the issue. And that might help you because just being able to break a person down into 50 different pieces, essentially, helps you to point pinpoint what might help them to grow. So to give a so, practical so to give a practical example yes. of that, one of the competencies um, is organization. Okay. Yep. And so uh, it may be with that's within the job scorecard, one of the competencies. So it may be an absolute requirement, like a five, to do this role, you need to have a five out of five on organization. So then you're going back in a performance management review a year into the future and you're saying, I can see why this person is failing because they're really only a two, maybe a three out of five on organization. Like that's the issue here. Yep. And so that's Perfect. how you can use the job scorecard competency assessment during performance uh, appraisals in the future. You just, you just gave me an interesting idea. I'm, I'm working with my daughter on her business, Brad, and she's having a hard time keeping up with some things. And I just thinking she needs herself to get a bit more organized, right? And that's a, it's something you can learn, but she hasn't learned it yet. And uh, I got an idea that I might need to share with her. That's perfect. Okay, so let's go back to the beginning. Really, we're talking about in today's show about this thing called a job scorecard developed by Brad Smart, the author of Top Grading. It's an amazing tool and resource that we are both massive fans on. It's a game changer. And even when I, when I did the book Scaling Up and interviewed 50 CEOs around the world, eight of them cited top grading as being a game changer for their business. That's how I got trained on it. And that's how I became so passionate about it, just because it's evidence data. It makes a difference. So within that, there's this thing called the job scorecard where you do an engineer's drawing of what the job is and what great looks like versus a, you know, a, a kid's crayon drawing that most job descriptions, unfortunately, result in. That's the root of it. And we've talked about why it's powerful, how it can help you, how to use it, the idea that the team that's hiring needs to be aligned around it. After they meet candidates, instead of an emotional discussion, you go back and evaluate on it. And it's just a very, very potent and powerful tool that helps you to get better people on your team and avoid the pain for yourself and candidates of putting the wrong people in a spot where they're going to fail. Awesome. Um, uh, absolutely fantastic tool. Before you hire anyone, make sure, before you even decide, make sure that you build a job scorecard. All right. So if you yep. need more information on job scorecards, uh, you can visit one of our websites. Jeez, that's the closest yes. thing, Kev, that we've ever come to an advert. Um, but that's that, that is close. wow. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, so you can find Kevin at lawrenceandco.com. You can find myself at evolutionpartners.com.au. Um, thank you for listening. As always, the growth, the growth whisperers, Kevin and Brad. We look forward to having a chat to you every week about building enduring great companies. Do enjoy your week. We look forward to seeing you next week. Take care. Have a good one.